I fully realize that the subject this morning is not very enticing in the program, but I think there are some important points to be made. Perhaps uh, to restore our recognition of some of the simple truths that we are all overlooking every day. Uh, Homer, in writing the story of the Odyssey, mentions that the gods of Greece and Troy fought in the heavens above the city. And uh, Troy, incidentally, was completely destroyed over a family feud. An instance of this is of my of point of view. Uh, Troy was located in what is now Asia Minor in the site of another war and a series of wars, most of which have no more basis in existing facts than the war at Troy. And uh, in both cases, ancient and modern, the gods are called upon uh, to fight for their respective sides, and no one seems to pay any attention to the fact that when the gods fight each other, one of their own teams has to lose, all of which is part of our general tendency to ignore the facts of life. The simplest fact we know about life is that we're all together here on a little ball in space about, uh, about 8,000 miles in uh, diameter, going at a great speed in space with a small layer of atmosphere around it and outside of that a vacuum where nothing that we know here can exist. This has been going on for quite a long while and this has become quite a, an important home site for peoples growing on this planet. Now the planet itself is a mixed blessing in many ways, but essentially important. Uh, the planet is composed of various materials and the surface is divided into land, water, and ice areas. Of the surface of the earth, probably the largest single element is water. Uh, on the, in the midst of the water, there arise continents. And at the north and south pole, there are great banks of ice and glacier that never melt. Now, in this peculiar atmosphere, in this environment, humanity began, or at least it was isolated here as though shipwrecked in space. Here we have on this planet now approximately six billion people. These human beings are all of them limited by this particular environment we are all shipwrecked together on a relatively small planet. And at the same time, if we, even with this realization, we can't seem to get along together. There seems to be no advantage in separating because there's no place to go but out. And if we go out, that is the end. We talk about the possibility of habiting other planets, but at the moment, there doesn't seem to be much real estate selling out there. We are here, living together. At the time of the siege of Troy, there were less than 200 million people on the earth. Today, it is becoming crowded. Those people had no worry about traffic jams. They had no difficulty in harvesting. There was no probability of shortages of essential resources. But these people lived in a planet which was sparsely populated, even as late as the Middle Ages. And yet these people began the process of, dis of disliking each other. And way back in the first days of recorded and uh, uh, allegorical history, wars. Wars, small and large. One uh, author covering the whole subject came to the conclusion that in the course of our history, humanity has fought nearly 10,000 wars, big ones and little ones and backyard fights. All of these contentions on a little planet hurtling through space. If the law of gravity failed for five minutes, that'd be the end of humanity. We live here because of the 
wonderful interaction of universal laws, and beneath the surface of our planet is a tremendous wealth of essential resource material. And here we sit, going on as we always have gone on, fighting our way for territorial sovereignty. <coughs> we know the animal kingdom makes a great deal of having its proper territorial rights. Today, territorial rights constitute almost anything we can get our hands on. But the idea of territorial right as a means of survival has become gradually modified because we are now one people on the planet, even though we can't get along together. So we have today a problem, a very serious problem. And we can go back to consider some of the things that have happened. Uh, Mao, the Chinese communist, made a rather uh, pertinent remark some years ago. He said the Chinese invite, invented writing and printing, and they did it with movable type, but they never printed a newspaper. They'd invented gunpowder and all kinds of fireworks, but they used them only for weddings, funerals, and celebrations, never for war. So there were two things. The third one he mentioned is the mariner's compass, which the Chinese also invented, but they were very careful not to use it for the discovery of the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> so we have, uh, going all the way back, he, uh, Mao probably has forgotten one of the great wars of China. He forgot the war that was fought probably in the 3rd or 4th century A.D., in which the battlefront was... 100 miles long. They have been excavating the bones and the weapons for years. From very early times, there was mostly strife. And this strife was essentially useless, worthless, and meaningless. Alexander the Great conquered near, nearly half of India and died under the walls of Babylon looking for further worlds to conquer. But he never conquered himself, and that was the end of it. This Roman conquest, we all know from history, it was the death of one of the great Egyptian pharaohs that brought Akhenaten to the throne of Egypt and made him the first pacifist in history. His reward was to be murdered. All these things happened. Caesar died at the foot of Pompey's statue, with a knife of his best friend in his heart. Always the same tragedies repeat themselves. Always the same dilemmas exist. Always the same ambitions go on and on, producing nothing but darkness and death, while this little ball floats through space. It's all very ridiculous. Also, we go a little further into the uh, imports of history to find out some of the things that happened. Consider the Crusades. Four waves of effort of the most powerful leaders of European life to reconquer the Holy Land. A dismal failure. Never was accomplished. And millions of people on both sides died or impoverished, wounded, or left desolate. This was one of the big experiences. Another one which we must also bear in mind is, of course, the uh, Crusades first, and after that, the, the, uh, the murder and abolition of the Knights Templars. The most powerful order of chivalry that opened the roads to Jerusalem was uh, decimated, destroyed, and its uh, leaders burned at the stake. Everywhere the same struggle went on. In France, the Huguenots. And in Japan, two efforts of the Kakans of Mongolia to conquer the country. The first time they sent a great fleet against Japan, and the same thing happened that happened with the Spanish Armada in the English Channel. Uh, a great storm arose and destroyed the Chinese fleet, so that the Japan, Japanese were spared. But the fear of it all was real and definite, and uh, a later... Dubla Khan tried it again. This time, however, the Japanese were ready for him. But out of this came a very sad circumstance. 
To defend the coastline of Japan, the Japanese created a militant order, which they now know and we now know as the samurai. These defended the country, but when there was nothing more to defend on the outside, they turned in and began to dominate the local and natural peacefulness of the Japanese people. Out of that came one rebellion after another, one conflict after another, till the final establishment of the Tokugawa shogunate. We look in among the, what happened in the Western Hemisphere. We realize what Cortes did to Mexico. When he came here, his first report to the Spanish crown was that the city of Mexico was the most beautiful city in the world, with magnificent buildings, marvelous path pathways and roads, and beautiful lagoons running through the city. In a very few years, he left it a total ruin. We go further no south into the uh, Maya area, and we find uh, Montejo, and the ruin of a completely civilized people of which nothing but ruin was left. Then we go to Pizarro in Peru, and we find he obliterated the civilization of the Inca. And when someone asked the Inca chief of what they did with criminals in that Inca state, he replied, I don't know, we never had any. But in a short time, in the effort to find the secret hidden treasures of the Incas, a complete civilization was destroyed. The highest civilizations probably of their time in Mexico, Yucatan, and South America were all destroyed by greed. So we have all this type of thing. We come on down through the Napoleonic Wars. We find all of these, and then we come down to the modern times. Two world wars in the, in the present century, after nearly 10,000 years of tradition and history, we are unable to cope with the problems of human relationship in the 20th century without causing the two greatest wars the world has known for a thousand years. What's the matter? This is really a problem. There has to be an answer to this, because this little ball is flowing through space. It can't go on this way forever. We are not only concerned now with the little ball and its peoples, but we find out that people begin to believe that this ball is something they own. We find people buying and selling this ball, admit parts of it as they can get hold of. They have an idea that, these, that this earth was created for the purpose of enriching human selfishness. And we've been building on that thought for a long time, but there isn't much truth in it. We have never recognized the fact that natural resources belong to nature, that we are part of a great moral structure which we totally disregard. And as a result of that, we're in trouble all the time and have been ever since we started out. Now come the gods that fought over Troy. At this time and always in the past, Religion, unfortunately, has played a powerful part in the antagonisms of mankind. It was religion that caused the Inquisition. It was religion that resulted in one catastrophe after another, including the Trojan War. It was religion always in which, in the name of God, individuals kill each other. Now, why is this true? It is because we have as yet no real working concept of God. We have a whole series of theological definitions. We know that there are 72 names of him recorded in the Shem Ham Faresh of the Kabbalah, but we have never found the mystery of the one God. We have never found a God whom we could all gather and revere. It's been divided into sectarianisms and various religious revelations which are, for the most part, difficult to bring together. We have a fighting now in the, in the Near East and in many parts of the world. We have Christian, Jew, and Muslim fighting in a land which is governed by an ancient code that says, Thou shalt not kill. But this is ignored. It is always right to kill anybody who doesn't believe as you do. This has been the story of religion since the beginning. 
Therefore, we find that religion has motivated probably most of the great wars of history. Religion has motivated so that all of them, in one way or another, were holy wars. Napoleon was, was convinced that God had ordained him to unite Europe. One group after another, under political or religious terms, has gone on a, create, a crusade to end all war by exterminating the human race. So here we are now with another problem coming up very closely. We are now working also beneath the surface of this little planet that is floating through space. We are gradually exhausting its natural resources. We cannot go on taking petroleum out forever. For this little bottle, which we call a planet, has limited capacity. We are now withdrawing from the earth resources that were millions of years in the making. And we are putting nothing back except refuse. We have done nothing to protect the survival of the future. We live only now to, for the future to take care of itself. This is beginning to catch up with us. And on every hand today, there is a great dissension. And most of this dissension is against selfishness. It is against the effort, effort to monopolize on the natural resources of the planet. And these resources have to be conserved, or we're going to be in a very serious way, possibly before the end of the present generation. So to accomplish all these things, we're going to have to begin to think a little differently. We're going to have to realize that in this world of ours, nobody owns anything. This is a difficult thing to believe because we've been borrowing money on what we didn't own for ages. But in sober fact, all that we have belongs to space. All of it belongs to this mysterious and wonderful unity, which we call life. It belongs to the mystery of the solar systems and the cosmic systems and the great ch chains of worlds. We do not own the planet. We cannot buy it. We cannot sell it. We cannot keep it. No matter how hard we conquer it, we are going to die and somebody else is going to get it. There is no way of having the kind of ownership that we think. Therefore, what we term wealth is an illusion. As long as wealth is concerned with physical possessions, we are getting rich off of something we don't own, we are spending the principal as well as the interest. There is nothing in the physical world that we actually own. We don't even own our own bodies. We are here as part of a great plan we are here to grow and to use the facilities of nature to become better. We have never seemingly recognized our moral responsibility to the plan to which we belong. And the time has come when more thought must be directed in that position and that relation. We are not the owners of the earth. We are not the owners of our brothers. We cannot enslave anybody successfully. And we, at the same time, cannot gain peace, happiness, or security for ourselves alone. Each group fighting itself is like the jungle with the territorial domain given to a tiger or a lion. We have here now one humanity. There's nothing we can do about this but recognize it. We realize this one humanity is not a magnificent, massive structure, it is something existing on one of the humblest and most unimportant of the planets in the solar system. We are here because of the need for growth, for the need to build something, to fulfill a purpose, so that each of us, as, they go out, as we go out of incarnation, take something with us we didn't have when we came. And the things we take with us can never be material accomplishments. We are here definitely to correct selfishness and to outgrow the concept of eternal segregations and also the ultimate sovereignty of this planet by one political or religious unit. There is only one religion big enough for the planet, and that is the religion that is made up of all religions. We have now a very strong religious majority in this planet. 
this majority is all bound by oath and obligation to rules or convictions that are essentially benevolent. We have in, the, in all, probably, out of our six billion, we probably have four and a half billion moderately associated with religion. These constitute many different faiths, but they represent in every case a pronouncement of the golden rule. Yeah, many years ago when I visited Jerusalem, though there was on the Mount of Olives a little chapel that may not even be there anymore. And on the walls were the golden rule in all different languages. That you do, do unto others as we would have others do unto us. Now, there's practically no religion that does not accept this, but does not live it. We continue to be competitive in our ethics in disseminating a doctrine that is cooperative. We are constantly trying to take people out of one faith and put them into another. We are perfectly willing to destroy a non-believer, and this is happening every day in the Near East now. We are not separated by our humanity, but by our inhumanity. We are not separated by the color of our skins or by our languages. We are separated by the belief that there are better and worse creatures in this world, when in reality there are only those of varying degrees of deprivation. So we have to begin to think rather seriously now of getting over some of this. This idea of the gods fighting over the city walls is now strong right here on our planet. It is now being divided up into two groups. Probably the most powerful groups that we have are the Muslim groups today. And even the Muslims are not united. The Muslims are divided into several different groups with very little in common except the Koran, which nearly all of them generally disregard. They disregard it because it interferes with the temporal ambitions of people. Out of every country there has risen dictators dominant personalities, the Hitlers, the Mussolinis, the Napoleons. These people have all of them used humanity as a weapon against their enemy. They have built the idea that their way would sometime run the world. And in every case, their way has not run the world, and they have departed into silence with the mistakes that they made. So we have to outgrow this. We're getting very close to the time when we'll either have to begin to find common ground or there won't be any common ground left for us to find. We're going to have to conserve resources. We're going to have to get over the petty uh, differences with which we have cursed ourselves for so long. Religion is important, very important. But religion must be interpreted in terms interpreted in terms of idealism and not in terms of material conquest. We are not here to convert each other. We are here to live constructive lives and help each other, regardless of race or beliefs or any other dividing artificial factor. We are here to learn companionship, brotherhood, fraternity, and to unite to protect this little ball floating in space from being disintegrated by the very people that live on it. We are here to make certain that this little world becomes once more the garden that it was in the beginning. It was a beautiful place with everything that was necessary for happiness and security. In it we had the privilege of eminent domain for a time. We all came and went, as Omar tells us in the Rubiyat. But that could be and was a very beautiful world. And according to some beliefs at least, in this beautiful world people lived a very long time. They didn't measure their lives in 70s or 80s or 90s. They measured their lives in centuries because they were peaceful, living off of natural means and natural ways. They loved each other, served each other, worked together, and to all these things much was added to them. Competition is not only a destructor, destroyer of empire, it is a destroyer of physical health, mental health, and emotional health. The, the great struggle to dominate each other 
is more or less ridiculous when we realize what we dominate. We dominate nothing. Two minutes of a minor tilt on the Earth's axis and there's nothing for us to dominate, including ourselves. We are here not to dominate each other, but to prove that there is some way in which we can outgrow the deficits of human nature. Now, why should we be here in the first place? Is there any particular reason why six billion people should be on this little ball in space? I think possibly the ancients had as good an answer to that as we're ever going to have. This little house, this planet, is the anteroom. It is the proneus of the temple of eternity. It is the entrance to the everlasting. We are here to grow and become worthy of citizenship in a larger world. We are not here to try to make this the great planet and cover it with monuments standing over the graves of the dead. We are here to learn this is a school, not a place of permanent residence. And the trouble is now with us is we're not graduating anybody. We keep on having the school and we go over the same lessons time and time again. And when the time comes for examination, most of the examinations end in failure. We are here to learn and not to possess. We are here to work together and not to hate each other. We are here to grow up and fulfill the needs of human society and not try to divide it up and underprivilege the majority part of it. We are here simply to be simple human beings with kindly good intentions, with friendliness, with a recognition that it is up to us to help to conserve the neighborhood, that we are here to work together and not to work each other. We are here not to accumulate but to become. What we have we cannot take with us, only what we grow. And what we grow in this case is within ourselves. It is character, integrity, realization of values. Now, what does the gods have to do with this? Are they really on one side of something or on the other side of something else? Do we gain the favor of God by being converted to a belief? In the presence of maybe ten or twelve fairly major religious beliefs on this planet, there has never been a really happy understanding that there is and can be only one religion. The one religion is in that it must be based upon the conduct of human beings, the ennoblement of humanity, and the dedication of all effort to the service of all need. Religion begins in service. It begins in the individual contributing to something that is not perishable. It is not by building bigger churches, but by building better people that the ends of religion are accomplished. We are here definitely, first of all now, to get over all sectarian religious division. This doesn't mean that we have to condemn anyone. It doesn't mean that we have to convert one individual to another. It doesn't mean that we have to create one religion and demand that all the others follow it. It is simply that we recognize in our hearts that all essential beliefs are the same. Therefore, that we can mingle in absolute equality with all who are trying to live the right kind of life. There is no need of changing the church. There is only need of changing the attitudes of people to the church and to get them away from these selfish situations which also finally t taint the church itself. So we have got to work to get our religions so that no longer will the gods f fight in heaven above the earth. They never did, but it was a good excuse. No one ever knows what the real answer to that might have been, but I think Homer uh, hints at it when he points out that the final answer is the creation of the world hero. Uh, the Greeks recognized a, a race of beings called heroes. They were not gods and they were not mortals, but they were the immortal mortals. They were the link between heaven and earth. And these, these heroes were those who awakened 
the inner resources of themselves and became the spiritual guardians and guides of humanity. They are the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of Asia. They are the saints and sages of the West. They represent a, a maturing of people until there comes a time when each individual in his own way and in his own cycle of life dedicates his efforts, his resources, and himself to the common service of all the others. There's got to be a final establishment of brotherhood, a final establishment of the recognition that we can make this little sojourn here much happier than it has been in the past. There is a distinct and definite relationship between human health and the world health. There is a definite relationship between the conflicts in society and the psychotic pressures within the individual himself. Our ambitions are killing us. Our various feuds and fusses are destroying us not only with weapons, but with the destruction of the resources of our own health and body. We are destroying our own minds. We are destroying our own bodies. And the only answer we can find for it is the common statement, is we are having fun. We are not having fun. There is no fun in a world in which the average person cannot live a decent life. And we have come so far and learned so much and had so many great teachers who knew at least parts of the truth that there seems to be no reason why we should be fighting now on the same level as the Trojan War. There is no reason why we should repeat the Inquisition. There is no reason why we should go through again the same tyrannies that disfigured the past. We had religious revolutions, political revolutions, and social revolutions from the beginning. We have them again, but they are more bitter, more extravagant, wasting more essential resources than ever before. It wasn't so bad when they fought it out by throwing rocks at each other because you could save the rocks and use them for something else afterwards. <laughs> but the way it is now, we are exhausting all the resources of the earth in order to defeat each other without realizing that by so doing we are digging the earth out from under all of us. We are getting into deeper and deeper difficulties every single day. The uh, problem then comes right down to finding out what will do some good. Uh, actually, we can't control other people. We can't prove to another person that he's wrong. We can try, and usually we will be thoroughly whipped for doing it. But we can begin to, in various ways, reach into our inner resources, and even if the ulterior motive persists, we can say to ourselves, I'd rather be healthy than sick. I'd rather be happy than unhappy. I'd rather be energetic than tired. And the world I'm living in is making me sick, making me tired, and making everybody uh, unhappy. Therefore, the problem we have to figure in terms of policy, in terms of government, is to find the common denominators where we can take this strain off ourselves and end it forever. We do not need to have these great struggles over government. We do not need to have millions of dollars spent trying to elect somebody to something. These things do not do the work for the reason that whoever is elected, the same thing happens. It all goes on because the individual and the community spirit is not strong enough to defend integrities. We are still hoping for a little profit. We are still sacrificing honor for possession or for luxury. We, could, do, we do not need to go through all these struggles and problems. And there is a coming a greater and greater intensity of determination to change some of these matters. We are finding it everywhere. Groups are springing up everywhere to correct common problems. We are beginning to wake up to the simple facts of life. And it's a very important thing that we continue to awaken and not be no lulled back into sleep by something. We are very definitely on the verge of important decisions, but they will only be made correctly if we are unselfish. While the last thought is what we're going to get out of it, then there will be no correction. 
We have got to work together to change the basic pattern of this little molehill, as we, what Mark Twain called the planet Earth, is not going to be able to survive either. We do not know what happens inside the Earth. We do not know the psychic and uh, electronic processes within the planet. We do not know what is under there, but we know there's something under there because that something is protecting, guiding, and nourishing everything on the earth. And what, without any thought of any kind, we're digging it all out if we can. We don't know what we're doing even and are too set in our material ambitions to even try to find out. There is no question of trying to examine the earth as possibly a great patient suffering from a serious malnutrition, a patient who has been exploited, an a planet which has had so many transfusions taken out of it that there's not very much planet left, less all the time. And yet we continue to go on to take the last barrel of oil, and what do we use it for? Largely blow it up more. So we're using the lifeblood of a planet to hate each other. We're using it to waste. We're using it to become richer and uh, more sedate individuals and with high transportational facilities. We are not even giving a thought to the planet. And yet it's all we have. There is nothing else. If that slips out from under us, it's gone. There's no place to land. We tried to take a journey over to see how the moon would be, but it wasn't very hopeful. It too is dead. How it died, we won't try to figure out. But we now have a, a situation where for the first time we've got to take a hard, long look at the natural resources which do de we depend upon. The only renewable element that we have found at the present time is wood. Outside of that, nearly everything can ultimately be expanded. Stone, of course, can fall back to become stone again. But most of the things we're taking out of the earth, chemical, material things, all kinds of fuels, all kinds of uh, minerals, mineral wealth, we don't know what we're taking out when we cannot take out another mass of diamonds or jade. We don't know what these things are. We don't know why they're there. We don't know how they got there. But there's just the point to think about that they were there for a reason and not simply to uh, satisfy the cupidity of some earthly businessman. We have a planet to take care of, and it's showing signs of sickness. There are modifications of climate that are very peculiar. There are modifications in our atmosphere we are loaded with smog and chemicals. We keep right on. The, the uh, smog, no one says you can't do anything about it. That's all right. You can do something about it. But people apparently have no intentions of doing anything seriously about it. There's great talk, and there's some controls, and then the next time the weather is bad, we have it all over again. There has to be a union now also to protect the globe we live on. We have to consider the planet as the greatest piece of real estate that we have, and the only piece. And we also have to realize that this piece of real estate belongs to the universe finally and entirely, and not to us. We are merely servants, stewards, in a garden. We are here to protect resources and to, or to create the bad karma of abusing resources. The individual who misuses the natural resources of life is earning punishment somewhere. Now we also realize that this world is made up of people who come and go. We realize also in some cases by the belief in reincarnation that those who go may come back. If they don't believe this is true, then there must be more new ones coming in all the time. At least this planet is being handed down from one generation to another, and each generation gets a poorer bargain. Each generation has the opportunity to pay more for less. 
But this is the problem. What are we gaining out of it? I think the answer that we have to take from that is only one thing possible, and that is experience. The only thing we can take with us is what we learn and what we become by our own integrities. What we can take with us has nothing to do with any physical problem. And because we cannot take anything with us, the whole theory of accumulation is very badly undercut. We have no particularly good thing to do with what we do have, especially on the level of accumulation. We can leave it to our children, but that may be another disaster. We, have, we are not knowing what to do to make life interesting except by accumulating. And accumulating is gambling, and gambling is a process of taking from Peter to please Paul. One of these times we're going to realize that this kind of fun is too dangerous. So we have a planet, and we have people. We have new epidemics. We have all kinds of health problems springing up. We have all kinds of moral and ethical problems springing up. All of them dependent largely upon the individual dominating his own life with his own selfishness. We want to do what we want to do, regardless of whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. But actually, the universe can win that fight over all of us. We can do what we want to do for a certain time and then we have to pay. There is no avoiding that pay. And sometimes it comes much sooner than we expect. Instead of being something that happens ten generations from now, it may be on our own doorstep. There is no question about the fact that man is morally responsible for the material uses he makes of his material environment. He is re responsible for turning the world over to his own descendants in as good a condition as when it came to him. He has no right to uh, create a bankruptcy for himself and then hand eternal debt onto his children. He has no right to make the world unlivable for the generations that have to come. And if he does this type of thing, there is a punishment. Now, the materialist believes that there's nothing but extinction beyond the present life. Even so, this does not remove the factor of punishment. Many of those who are delinquent are punished here and now. They do not have to wait for any future. But if we want to build a better life for ourselves, I think we take more or less the view of the Oriental namely that there is a re-embodiment in the environment. And if we wreck it, we come back to it. That should put a little fear in our hearts, but that's too abstract. So we have a, a peculiar fallacy that is now uh, working through us tremendously, and that is the fallacy of do it now. We have lost faith in the future. We do not believe in futures anymore. We say to ourselves, eat, sleep, and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. We have lost hope as far as building together for a great purpose. This loss of hope is simply an illusion. This loss of hope is a lie with which we try to fortify our own lack of discipline and our own willingness to curb our own selfishness. There is no reason why we must turn a bankrupt universe back to God. There is no reason why we should not make something out of it. Now, in the philosophies that we more or less rec recognize as good, there is a very interesting concept about this type of thing, this business of returning what we have borrowed. They have the story of the sowing and the reaping. We have the story of bringing the first fruits to the altars of the, of the Lord. So we have now an idea that this uh, life we live is a probation ship, something for which we should be grateful for opportunity, opp the privilege of becoming friends, not the privilege of making enemies. 
we have the privilege of doing it right instead of the power to do it wrong. We have everywhere the inducements to build a better world, but we don't pay much attention to this induce, these inducements because we think that other people rather than ourselves are going to benefit from them. Everything centers on self. And in this case, self is a very dangerous thing. You can't work it this way. We have to begin to build a proof of life here. I made quite an issue of it. He was convinced of the fact that deity was not going to interfere. In other words, God is not going to answer the prayers of the selfish and the, those with ulterior motives. God answers that which deserves answering because this is the law. Deity is a principle of integrity, and this principle serves all who keep the rules and departs post haste from those who break them. Therefore, it is not a case of whether God can prevent evil. God does not cause evil. Man causes evil. God is not going to take over the problem of curing delinquencies. That isn't the purpose of evolution. The purpose of evolution is that the individual of his own integrity shall do that which is right. The individual will become the ch champion of his own cause, knowing that if his cause is right, universal law or deity will be with him. If he does it wrong, there is no prayer, chant, or mantra that will make it right. We've got to get down to some of these fundamental factors in our daily existence. If we don't, we're going to drift on into a new century. There is evidence that the actual situation is taking over. There is greater thoughtfulness. But there are several areas in which this thoughtfulness are being, uh, is being neglected. This thoughtfulness, particularly now in our religious life. We are not uniting religiously under the cause of the present day. We have the great struggles between various political units in the name of religion. With the religion is used as an excuse or as an arbitrating factor. But in the realities, we are not using religion to bring about world peace. We are t working on the religious problem in the way that if you will join our religion, we will be peaceful yes. together. There is no willingness of religion really, honestly, to honor the faiths of other people. Somewhere along the line, religious barriers have to come down. Religion has to be regarded for what it really and actually is, and that is a faith in the reality of things, a faith in the principles behind things. There is no reason why the four, million, four billion people who are making up the religious world should not be immediately reconciled. They will not be reconciled, but it's not because of their religious differences. It's because of the ulterior motives that have been built up around these differences. And it's very often the result of a few selfish leaders using a doctrine to bind people to the to serfdom of some kind of political or industrial slavery. There is no doubt in the world that most of the religious people left to their own devices and not stimulated by false teachings or activism of some kind, that they would get together and make a very happy family. We need the happy family religion. We need the religion in which we recognize that the purpose of religion is to protect the environment, protect the internal life of the individual, and conserve in every way possible the resources of the universe. These things are the way of God. Now, deity could, theoretically at least, force this upon us. We, and if it comes to something else, it wouldn't necessarily even be deity that forces it. We would force it on ourselves, 
by breaking the rules of deity. It is far better then for us to start in working to build some kind of a basic integrity into the life of the world. Now there are certain nations and countries in which most of these principles are very, very strong. And I think that then among those principles we find people of every faith and every nation. But here we have certain privileges to do things. And I think we should make every possible effort to do them. We should begin to try to set up a model of a better way of life. We should gradually develop within this country what it was intended to be. It was intended to be the symbol of a united world. It was to be a symbol of peoples of all faiths and all beliefs working together, living together, thinking together, hoping together. It was to be a unity of people without class or caste, with equal opportunities for all and special privileges for none. This was what was intended, but this isn't what we find now. And what trouble is, we can't change it because it seems to interfere with the success of too many people to bring the thing back again into truth and order. Fortunately, however, we're getting awfully tired of some of the things that are happening here. The Near East is an abomination. We're developing the same problems throughout Latin America. All these various areas that have been at each other's throats for years are again at each other's throats, trying to solve problems by killing hoping to achieve the brotherhood of man by exterminating anyone who disagrees with them. Well, this, is, uh, this can't go on. Because in order to exterminate the, roi, the race by this procedure, we will also exterminate the planet. We will so poison it and so, de de uh, so toxinize it that nothing can live on it. And little by little we begin to notice the effects of these things upon our harvests, upon our thinking, upon our family lives. Everything is gradually going into a toxic state, due very largely to mental and immoral stock toxins that we're spreading all over the world. We've got to get together on something that is basic. And I think the one thing that might help us to recognize is the fact that we are all by ourselves on a little ball, and that this ball is not going to get bigger, and all the wealth in the world is not going to make it more prosperous. We're not going to be able to have more resources than we possess. We're not going to be able to take out of this earth more than is in it, and we are gradually exhausting the concept of private wealth and we are exhausting the process of an eternally bountiful nature that will let us make every kind of mistake and then forgive us. We are in a problem where I think physical sciences should begin a very careful study of the effect of human attitudes upon the material substances of the planet, that we begin to analyze the electric and magnetic currents by means of which life is perpetuated on the planet, we're going to understand more about the fertility of crops and find out where this energy comes from. We believe and know for certain from some things that it originates from the sun and finally comes here. But it's part of a great organization. It's not a place where it is channeled into delinquency groups and prisons. It is a energy that is diffused for our good. It is not diffused for us to sell it by the ounce. It is our use to rise out of this type of life and come to the realization that happiness is when we're all happy or all doing those things which create happiness. And that excessive ambition and excessive uh, personal possession is simply gradually cutting the earth out from under our feet. We are now in the sixth billion. Next time, by maybe the end of the century, only 10 or 12 years more, we will be up to seven billion. We will go on and on until we crowd each other off the planet. But nature isn't going to do it that way. 
if we have not the skill and wisdom to make some of these cons conscious changes for our own good, we will have to take the consequences. Now, it's quite true, for instance, that those of us who are alive today may not see the fulfillment of all these dreams and hopes. We probably won't. But if we begin to think in terms of them and take that thought with us when we leave here, it will mean that living in this world has taught us something. And we don't want to go before the great tribunal of the infinite, wherever and whatever it may be, and when asked what we learned here, we won't be able to say as the only thing that there are ways by which you can make 15% profit on the investment. That is not what we're here for. We're here for something a little better than that. It would be better for us to be able to go out and know that we are wiser in essentials and that if it is our turn to come back, we will come back as better people able to do more for the common good and to build it forward. And the words of Woodrow Wilson, it is very important to remember that it is better to fail in a cause that is right than to succeed in a cause that is wrong. We have to face these decisions, but we have to also grow. The only reason for human beings being here is to improve. And we have no evidence that narcotics helps to improve. We have no reason to think that our rock music helps to improve. We have no reason to think that the collapse of the stock market is helping basically to improve anything. It is simply revealing our own mistakes. Now, we can learn from our mistakes, and that makes them valuable. But to just perpetuate them, hoping to get away with it next time, will take us out of here poorer than when we came. There's, every human being ought to be at least 1% wiser when he leaves. He should have learned something of the integrities of life. He should have learned something of the eternities of value. He should leave this world a better person than when he entered it. He should not be in a position where he decides that suicide is the only way out. He is here to gain some kind of internal fortitude, to learn to appreciate the beautiful, to serve the good, to dream of the things that can be. He may not live to see them, but this does not mean that the attitude is failing or is a loss. The, learn, the things we learn now become the, the basic materials for future embodiments. The, the, the moral values we discover become part of the inner life, and they alone can we take with us when we leave here. And uh, it's a pity to make a pretty, nice little planet like this go through such concautions as we've forced upon it. We are the ones who are ruining it. It is still the wonderful planet. And with a little love and a little help and a little care, it can be a garden for unborn generations to come. But if we continue consistently to abuse it, it is going to also turn on us and create a generation of people incapable of attaining to a high degree of cultural maturity. I think we have to think, therefore, no longer about the gods fighting over the walls of Troy, no more about the who is right in war and which side divinity is on, and realize that divinity is on the side of peace, and realize that as long as we do not attain to the peace, with which we were intended uh, to achieve, we will have these kind of problems. And they will get worse. Now, peace is a nice big word. It has all kinds of meanings. It also means peace over the back fence. It means neighbors getting along without gossiping and tearing down each other. It means a, a person who is proud of somebody else's better character. One who is pleased when the neighbor's son gets a better job and doesn't think always in terms of what I'm getting and what I'm not getting and why it's all unfair. We need to have the kind of peace that comes in marital relationships, where there is a mutual understanding, where there are depths of values, and where things of great importance like parenthood are accepted with a joyful realization of privilege. We are privileged 
to bring in and to mature lives that will be useful to us and will help the world to grow. We need also this peace in the garden. We need in the weeding out of that which is unnecessary. We need in the moderation of life and the curbing of extravagance of all kinds and also the, to get over forever keeping up with the jo Joneses. We also have the importance of reorganizing our monetary structure to the, for the purpose of seeing that money is what it was intended to be, a medium of exchange and not a basis of wealth. That was, that was discovered by the Greeks long ago, that as long as wealth is an end in itself, it is the bitterest pill that we ever will have to swallow. Wealth is nothing but the means of communicating and exchanging. It is not convenient for the average person to put a load of hay in his back pocket. Therefore, he gets a token, a symbol of that, which he can exchange for something that he needs. But when he starts loaning the, that exchange at double, pay, double rate and all this type of thing, he gets into trouble. He also gets into trouble when he fails to recognize the rights of the person who sells to him and, and who, is determined, who is entitled to the same consideration as he expects for himself. As long as money is a symbol of, tra of, of communication or in uh, exchange, it's all right. But when it becomes the end for which people work, where someone gets a five, seven, five or ten million dollars a year and another one has no bread, we're in trouble. This is the type of thing we're going to have to think of because this is our world. This is our little planet whirling through space, headed we know not where. Possibly in a few billion years it may disappear entirely, but by that time its purpose also will have been finished. In the meantime, it is up to us to make sure that we make this planet a success and that the powers that fashion this planet uh, expect us to do so. We are none of us completely free. We have the right of choice. We have a right to do that which is best for all concerned or to do that which is worse for all concerned. And we see as we look around us many, many opportunities to build these better things that we dream of. We face the great confusion of congestion. Congestion is a, a one of the byproducts of unrestrained and irrational economics. We finally will bring all motion to the dead stop because there will be no way to move any further. This is just an emblem of our own stupidity. We have, should have cured these things in the beginning. There should have been regulations over what we do and what we have. Regulations not by a political group, but by common sense, by realization of the values which we are now beginning to understand. So now, now in this late period of the, 19th, of the 20th century, we are beginning to see the facts of life. We are now coming to the point where we can't deny them anymore. We know we've got the congestion. We know that the buildings are too high. We just saw a big office building here get into trouble. We are seeing constantly the consequences of doing it wrong. We see the result of cheating. We see the result of exploitation in religion. We see these things and they're very evident. But for some unknown reason, we don't seem to make a lesson out of it. We don't see where it refers to us, but it does refer to us, perhaps in some ways more than others. One of the ways in which we are involved in many of these situations is through television. Television is coming into practically all of the homes of America, or the majority of them, and it is bringing a very poor level of entertainment an entertainment that inspires very little. And on rare occasions, we have a really good program. But for the most part, the programs cater to the indifference, to the lack of integrities with which we are all suffering. Also, we are exposing the next generation 
to this type of entertainment with no thought of the consequences. We wonder why crime goes up, but we don't examine to find out why. Because if we do, it might mean we'd have to stop doing things that we prefer to do. Therefore, everywhere we turn, there are troubles resulting from lack of self-control, lack of integrity, lack of idealism, and complete uh, bondage to the physical existence of which we are now a minor part. We are here only for fun. We are here that we are in a universe that isn't funny. And also, well, the more we look for fun, the less of it we'll find. Because the troubles we're heading into have nothing of fun about them. And while they seem to maybe cater for a while to our appetites and desires, all of a sudden something is going to fall and fall hard. Every person who has spare time on their hands should spend more of it doing things that are important than simply watching very poor entertainment. It's all right to have a few shows once in a while. Everyone's entitled to it. But there's no need for spending practically all of our leisure time watching artificial murders. This is a, and a few other little varieties thrown in. But the answer is that that time is useful. If we took an hour out of each of the days that we spend in, in uh, television viewing to instructing ourselves, to informing ourselves about the facts of life, what is happening and why, not depending upon the reports of news re reporters, but by common sense thinking things through calling for the first time, perhaps, upon our own judgment in matters, looking and waiting to have an opportunity to say, I think this is wrong, or I believe that this is not correct. And the moment we say, I don't believe it is correct, we should stop doing it. And we should take the time that we waste and use it to become better people. There is certainly something we can do with time more important than sitting in front of a tube while it goes into all kinds of real or mostly imaginary uh, uh, dramatical uh, patterns. We have something better than this to do. Here we have a people uh, unaware of the better philosophies of life, unaware of the big, deep things which make people rich and in understanding, uh, learning to be more patient, learning to see through the infirmities of humanity and the better things that lie behind. More time to spend in sharing our thoughts with our children and with others, and less in front of something that offers nothing but escape. But we are in a position, in a predicament now, in which escape seems to be the happiest way of not thinking. The only way to avoid the inevitable facts is to laugh them off or to get our mind on some trivia which takes our minds off of the natural responsibilities with which we should be and are actually uh, confronted. There is no reason why the average person's leisure time should not help to rebuild human society. And there's always something that can be done. And that the last and only choice is self-improvement. The individual can gain knowledge, can gain understanding, can become aware of the great principles of life that he has no time for now. I have found the study of comparative religion to be a very magnificent thing, to, to enrich life and increase tolerance. It gives us something to build into the future. It shows us the thoughts of those who have thought well from the dawn of time. And it is also very amazing and interesting that these great thinkers are the ones that are remembered. They are still honored and always will be because they thought true. Those that think falsely will not become immortal. They will vanish into the earth. And as, as far as that's concerned, I read in the paper the other day, I don't know how true it is, but that a number of school children asked what... Or who was Adolf Hitler, and they'd never heard of him. He's gone. But no one who says they didn't, had never heard of Buddha or Confucius or Jesus 
in the countries where these things occur. There is a great wisdom, a wisdom of compassion, a wisdom of idealism that is truly, truly beautiful. There is something to understand about other people. We have now a melting pot of nationalities coming from here and there and everywhere. It is a probably pretty good idea for us to understand what they think and what they believe instead of casting them aside as unbelievers or heretics or something. We should realize that the exchange of arts and the exchange of knowledge are great civilizing force. When we exchange the laws of music with other peoples, when we find, find great paintings, when we do great works of sculpturing, all these things are part of the civilizing power of culture. And this culture is far more important uh, than rock music. It is more lasting. And we still honor those who have left to us the great masterpieces of literature and art. We also can leave a great literature of our own inner lives. We can think better thoughts. We can begin more idealistically with life. We can end the criticism with which we view everyone who differs from us and recognize that it is not these mental differences that are going to help us, the overcoming of them. When we solve a problem, we achieve something. When we shift it off or deny it or misweigh it, then we do nothing. So it is very, very important now for the individual to realize that we're on this little ball, that this little ball is getting tired, we all are, that this little ball is losing its power to defend us in terms of health, that is losing the energy necessary to take care of the population that is coming, and that it is up to us to get to one with nature and do everything possible to help to make a better life for ourselves and those who come after we go. Uh, we're going to have to reform the planet because we have destroyed most of it that has been destroyed. And every day we are endangering it more. We cannot allow this planet to become one great battlefield. It has got to become a place where we can live together in peace and understanding. And it isn't difficult. Imagine going along through life without hating anybody, without constantly arguing or with finding every opportunity to belittle something. All this is psychologically bad. The moment we start looking for faults, our own psychic integration is damaged. The moment we begin telling false stories about other people, our own minds sicken. Everything that is not normal, not healthy, not happy, not constructive, is dangerous to us. We have to get over this because it's becoming a mass ailment. And, uh, and we have psychological plagues today that are as dangerous as the bubonic plague in Europe. The various plagues are the misuses of energy and power. They are the result of our own failures to live up to our principles. There's no reason why we should become a na nation of drug addicts or a world of drug addicts. It is simply because it helps us to forget or to feel so ten feet tall when we're really about six inches high. It, it doesn't do us any good. The time is now is to roll up the sleeves, know our measure to be a certain amount that we were born with, that we are a person a person capable of conduct that is contributing to permanent value, capable of becoming better informed, capable of producing better children, giving them the sharing of parental understanding, giving them the background of reading and writing before they even go to school, giving them an internal sense of the integrity of life. When we put these children out somewhere at a board or something, we're not doing this. And if we sit them in front of television screens, we are doing them more harm than good. Yet you will say you can't take it away from them because all the neighbors have it. Well, that is true now, but we are responsible for that too. And we are responsible for gradually doing the things that win them back to value. It, I know several families with family discussions on these matters who have cut down television viewing without the children rushing out to find a set somewhere else. 
they be, if you share with them the reasons right, most children who have not been too badly spoiled are willing to listen because they see it in the schoolyard. They see it in the curriculum. They know they're not getting educated. Therefore, these things are more important than to try to forget them. Let's, try not, let's not continue trying to forget the problems. Let us not continue to worry about the problems. That is doing no good. But let's quietly settle down to seeing what we can do about the problems that will make them less dangerous, less difficult, and that we can be a little more satisfied with our own contribution to the common good. We need this type of thinking today. We've got to get over the idea that gods in heaven are fighting over human beings, that wars are created in heaven is not true, that the gods favor one side so that when they go to war very often, even in recent times, the armies are blessed in the churches and temples. The uh, idea of going out and fighting for the glory of God is still an unhappy career. There is no such a thing as pleasing God by destruction. There is no way of making the deity a better friend because we break all his rules. We do not need to break these rules. We should pray for peace and not for war. We should pray for arbitration and not for victory. We should pray for being able to be friends, to recognize the integrities and life rights of other people, respect them, and gradually in this way also gain an ascendancy over crime. For a large part of crime is simply the result of a bad environmental condition that must be changed. We are here in these formative years to build the foundation of a new century. We are here now to do the things that need doing, and we may have a little time left in which we can do some of these things, and it is very wise for us to lay the foundations of that which must come. And these foundations have got to be founded in the very principles that we have most uh, appreciated in life that the greatest of these is love, that to serve and love the life of our neighbor, to love the good in things, and to approach deity as a deity of love, and realize that love is the strongest and most powerful of all the laws. For the law of love is the law of forgiveness. It is the law of arbitration. It is the law of reunification. Love is the group living together in peace, each mindful of the needs of the, of the others. In our way, living in worlds of hate, each one unmindful of the needs of others and over-mindful of their own, we are having a very bad time. They let us not blame the, uh, the gods in any way for this matter. Let's not assume that, they, that the blessing of a bad motive will produce a victory. Napoleon found that out. Most of the dictators and leaders have acted or played the part of agents of heaven. They have come to do the work of God. And the work of God included the Inquisition and many of these great disasters. The works of God were served by killing each other. This is not only stupid, it is vicious. It is completely wrong. We are not here to destroy each other. We are here because that in every one of us is the same divine spark of life. And when we turn against our brother, we turn against our God in our brother. When we turn against a nation, we turn against its God. But if we, must, we must realize that all these powers come from one life, that the human being has created the empires we must live with. And these, this human being is creating things with a divine energy within himself. It is God in him that must lead him to find the God in all others. And when he does, he'll find there's only one God. He will find that there are no strangers in the universe. Man makes them. That there are no feuds in the infinite. Man perpetuates his own small toxic efforts. All these things have got to be solved in a better way. 
They've got to be solved, as Paul very well points out, that so love suffereth long and is kind. What we need in a world which declares itself to be modern, to have graduated from 12,000 years of previous civilizations, that this world find that the greatest of these is love. That out of all the hating, we must come in the end to the realization that love is the only answer. Love is kindness, tolerance. Love is respect for each other. Love is a natural recognition that there are no strangers. That what we call the stranger is ourselves in another body. If we come to these realizations and really practice them, we will find that wasted energy and wasted time will not de deter us any longer. We will begin to do the things that need doing that we have neglected. And in our effort to have a life of fun, we have le neglected the sources and causes of happiness. If we can get these back, we'll be much better off and much wiser. So we don't want gods fighting each other. We don't want the Muslims saying, Allah Akbar. We do not want the Christians saying, for the near glory of God. We don't want any of these things. What we want is peace, love, brotherhood, and companionship for the glory of the eternal and the permanent security and integrity of the human family.